We read from God's word now. Let's do so in, from the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. We're going to lead, read the last part of that chapter and then the first part of chapter 2. Philippians chapter 1 and then the last, first part of 2. The Apostle Paul, in the middle part of chapter 1, is expressing the conflict that he's experiencing. He's been in prison, he's been persecuted, and he's in a conflict in his own soul, he says in verse 23, between going to heaven and being with Christ, or staying here on earth, which he says would be of benefit to the Philippians. To stay here would be for your sake. This is how he puts it in verse 26, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Now let's continue. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye see in me and now here to be in me. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, 
I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. So far we read from God's holy word. The text that we have for this evening is found in verses 3, 4, and 5. 3, 4, and 5 of Philippians 2. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let not every man look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Note two things by way of introduction. The first is when we confess our faith, then we confess that there is a union between us and the Lord Jesus Christ, made by him, but there's a union between Christ and us. But the whole of the thought of the passage that we read emphasizes that not only is there a union between us and Christ, but that's true of so many of us with Christ, and thus we're made to have a relationship with each other. So when we say, I will lead a new godly life, that describes not only one in which I'm going to live in compliance with the Lord, Christ my Lord, but it also implies that it's one in which I will live in service, we could say, with the other members of the body, but the right way to say it is in service of all the other members of the body of Jesus Christ. That's the commitment. To say I'm one with him is to say I'm one with y'all. Second, Paul's in prison. Not the kind of warm, heated facilities that we provide for criminals today. But in a prison house. His greatest joy is not, I get out. Here he's writing a letter to these Philippians. He's in prison. They're free. Fulfill ye my joy. And you rejoice with me. Because this is the greatest source of joy. Namely, that you not only hold to the faith, but you hold to that faith together and that you are of one mind. Paul says that's, that's the greatest joy for me. Or as he puts it in verse 16, you hold that word so that I can rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain nor labored in vain. I want to know that about you. That's, that, I can stay in prison, but if I know that, I have the greatest reason for joy. Could you write that? Could I write that? Having the mind of Christ, that's our theme. First of all, the calling, the example, and then finally, the root calling in the 27th verse of the previous chapter 
Paul says, whether I come or not, this is what I want to hear about your affairs. That you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's the mind of Christ. Having one mind that you strive together for the faith of the gospel. Paul could not say that to the Philippians about their relationship with the heathen. You don't have anything in common with them. You live in the world, you breathe the same air, you might eat of the same food, but their goal is something totally different. He couldn't say that this is what they should have with other Jews who denied that Jesus was the Christ. Rejected that too. But when he looked at these who weren't with the one with the heathen and weren't with the Jews, but they had this in common. They believed in the gospel. They had each one of them one faith. There is only one faith. One Lord, one baptism, one faith. And that faith was in the good news that God in grace, undeserved favor, was pleased to save unto himself a people by sending his son to stand in their stead and bear their penalty in order that they might be freed from having to bear it and might have the hope of living with him forever in glory. That good news. Now you have to remain steadfast individually. Garrett just said that. I. Yes. But that's the same thing we've all confessed. And so to say it individually is to say it with us. So now the apostle says, okay, that means that you are of the same mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. This relationship that we're put into together is so important. There's, there's standing up for the truth. There is rejecting heresies that are repugnant there too. Yes. But all of those standing up for this truth are standing together. So important is that, that the, our church order, when it talks about the relationships that we have with each other, makes it a point to say that when it comes to non-essentials, we are together. Not just then PRs together, but with so many others. In the faith of the gospel. Now we can start making a list of what's an essential and what's a non-essential. But read this in the light of the apostles here. And then realize, realize this. That the devil, whose name is Liar, so we ought never believe him, has made his focus Always, one of his focuses is to separate and to divide. He wants to separate us from Christ by leading us into sin so that God would reject us. Look at that, Job. He's not doing it out of right motives. Be separated from him, God. That's what he did throughout the whole old dispensation. He wanted to separate. He delights to take an individual child of God and whisper in his ear. Did you know what you just sang in the second stanza of Psalter number 68? My sin is very great. So how, aware of all of that sin and sinfulness, could God love me and still love me? 
when I know the way I often act and think. How could he love me? And he wants to separate us from God and from Christ. Go back to last Sunday morning. Forgive us our debts as we forgive others who are indebted to us. He takes, he takes the sins that we commit and the hurts that we have against each other and he makes them huge and he separates us. Yeah, I recognize they're in the same church, but sure they stood up with me and confessed their faith in the Apostles' Creed, but I've got a list. I've got some other things against them. The devil loves to separate. Be aware. Always. He loves to destroy marriages. He loves to destroy relationships. He loves to ruin the unity of the body of Jesus Christ. He says it here. He's going to get even more specific in chapter 4 when he comes to Eodias and Synecdoche, two women in the church. He starts out the fourth chapter, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. My dearly beloved, I beseech two of you, my dearly beloved Eodias and Synecdoche, be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee, my dear true yoke fellow, help those women who labored with me in the Lord, in the gospel with Clement, and make them to know that their names are together written in the book of life. They're going to know that God elected them side by side. They may be arguing with each other. They may be focusing all on all the differences they've got with each other, but they've got to be of the same mind. And that starts by... Your names are in the same book of life. And when you stand in a relationship to the Lord, both of you together can rejoice in the Lord always. And now here he's looking at both of them, and he looks them straight in the eye, and he says, and again I say, rejoice. Your mind is rolling around all the things that she did and she said. Well, I want you to look at that woman and think of whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, you think on those things. Except he probably didn't say it the way I am. How important is this? Just a few examples. In Romans chapter 12, he starts the practical part of that letter. He says, We are, we. As we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ. And every one members one of another. We're not only members, we're members one of another. Then in verse 12, rejoicing in hope, or verse 10 rather, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another having preferences one for another. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, just before he's going to say, one of you says, I have Paul, another one, I have Apollos. He says in verse 10, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. A 
For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 11. Finally brethren farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. The men study in Ephesians chapter 2, Jew and Gentile. You know what the Gentiles heard about the Jews to them? He says, you're of the same household of faith. You're fellow citizens and you're heirs together of the kingdom of heaven. How is it that we can be of one mind? He tells us here in this text, we can be of one mind, first of all, by having lowliness of mind. The greatest enemy to the unity of the body of Jesus Christ in one-mindedness is thinking of self. Self-centered thinking is going to be manifested in strife and in glorying in self, worrying about how I can get ahead. Self-centeredness always arises out of that selfish motive, craving honor. And he's wise enough to say, that's vain, empty, hot air honor. What is lowliness of mind? Lowliness of mind is that spiritual virtue of grace according to which we have a proper evaluation of ourselves with respect to the talents and the labors that God has given to us in the midst of his church. One more time. Lowliness of mind. That spiritual virtue of grace according to which we have a proper evaluation of ourselves with respect to the talents and the labors that God has given to us in the midst of the church of Christ. We have a talent. We have an opportunity How, what's our aim in the use of that talent? What's our purpose with regard to this opportunity? Is it to set myself? Why is it that after there's some tension and we go back, we always think of better things we could have said. Well, my motive often for why I wish I had said something different is so that I could be proven to be right, more right. And I could have put them in their place down there, below me. The apostle, the young people saw this morning, begins his comments, his farewell comments to the church, to the elders at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 by saying, I came unto you with lowliness of mind, with humility of mind. That, that was his approach. He's bringing the most wonderful good news there could ever be. But he says, this is how I came to you, in humility of mind. To the church at Ephesus, he begins the practical part in chapter 4, 
by saying, I therefore, a spiritual prisoner and a physical prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that with all, all, never enough, lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavor. Endeavor means putting forth every effort. You, you hit the wall and you keep going. You keep endeavoring. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavor to keep, to guard the unity of the Spirit. The unity that the Spirit makes. He puts you together in the body. He makes the unity. You don't make it, but you have to guard it. How do we guard the unity? How do we have the same mind? We have lowliness of mind. Now, very concretely, the other side of that coin, lowliness of mind about ourselves, is the, the other side is that we esteem others better than ourselves. Those who are concerned for themselves, sometimes they're arrogant and sometimes they think that they can't be as good as everybody else, but they're both very concerned about themselves. Those who are concerned about themselves try in various ways to put down everyone else. They have a boat that they sail all the time. It's called one-upman ship. That's their ship. They love to sail it. You tell them about something in your life and, and it doesn't take long and they, they're talking about themselves. Because what you say reminds them about something they want to say about you. And usually the one-upmanship sails in the waters where they try to pull you down. Regardless of what you've accomplished, they try to pull you down. And that makes them a little bit better. But how can we esteem others better than ourselves? If we know that God has given us more tech gifts and talents than he's given others. What if we are better at basketball, at music? What if we do get 200 bushels of corn per acre and not, you know, 150 or 100? Aren't we better then? How can we concretely think better of others than of ourselves? It always starts with putting yourself with the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 1 verse 15. Christ Jesus came to save sinners. and corn, and talents, and different gifts that I may have in comparison to others all become really tiny little dust spots in the corner and along the wall in comparison to that which sits in the center of the room. And that's this. He came to save sinners of whom I am chief. I can't judge anyone else's motives. But everyone knows their own motives and how they're always mixed and imperfect. I can't judge yours, but I know mine. To consider someone better than oneself is that you do what well, you be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. James 1. The doer of the word is one who does not forget 
his natural face. He continues in the knowledge of his natural depravity and his sinfulness. And I don't know your sinfulness, but everyone knows their own. And when you continue in the knowledge of your natural face, and you don't straightway forget what manner of men you are, then, then, and I know myself, how can I be better than you? Really? Then you can start to say, I'm chief. I don't, you can say it all you want, but I know myself better than you do, and I am the chief of sinners. It's realizing, it's realizing that the gifts that I may have in comparison to others, well, there's other gifts. There's all kinds of other gifts. And, and I not only don't have the gifts <coughs> that others have, but I need them. And now think of the way the apostle did it in 1 Corinthians 12. I am sight, but I can't walk, and I can't hear, and I can't taste, and I can't think, and I can't digest food. I need all those other parts. What is sight all by itself? I can't be better. What I have is just a tiny little fraction of all these other things that I need to make up the body. And that brings us immediately to this next point. He puts it this way in verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Notice, not just on the things of others. You've got your own things in mind too, but you don't only have your own, and this is the better way to look at it, your own interests. You look on also the interests of others. Well, how does that work? It goes this way. My gift of sight. is for the sake of the whole. What's an eyeball lying on the ground all by itself good for? Nothing. But when that eyeball is serving all the other parts and it doesn't serve itself, but it's focusing on serving, on giving, I have been gifted for the sake of, not promotion of self, vain glory, but for the promotion of others. When we seek to profit not ourselves, but everyone else with our, and it starts here, with our thoughts, let alone our words and our deeds. And when the eyeball starts thinking, first of all, of how much the Lord Jesus did to make him an eyeball. What a miracle of grace to give him vision, to give him the ability to see how Christ served him. Didn't just give these things to him, but died spent 33 and a half years of labor on earth without a bed that he could call his own all in order so that this can be an eyeball. What is it to be a mother? What is it to be a father? What is it to be a grandpa? No. <coughs> to serve. To serve. You 
You want a motive? You want an example? Look at Christ. God the Son is his person. And as God the Son, he has the divine nature and all, all of the attributes, infinitely so, of the divine being. And he's had them forever. He knows all things. He is able to do all things. And what did he do? If he had stayed there, there would be no body. There would be no sheep. There would be no church. Heeding the will of his heavenly Father, he humbled himself. Lowliness of mind, who more than Christ had reason to think highly of himself? He had everything. But he emptied himself. He let go of every divine attribute. They would flash out in his miracles so that everybody knew he had them. but he emptied himself of his right to exercise them. God, in a, in a stall, in a cattle stall, in a feeding trough, not able to feed himself, not able to change his own diapers, he emptied himself. That's the humility of our Savior. And that's just becoming a man. Because his humility and his emptying of himself went further. He didn't just become a man. He became a servant of men. And he didn't just become a servant of men. He was willing willing to empty himself of the right to live. So he took upon himself the judgment of death, the wages of sin. And he didn't just humble himself to die, he humbled himself to die the death of the cross, the cursed death, the death that said, God hates you and is punishing you in hell. He, he took all of that. Why? So that he could be lifted up? So that he could be exalted? So he could have a name? No. Because he wanted to do the will of his Father in heaven and because he wanted to save wretches like me and you. He did it in service because he saw whatever gifts and talents he had as opportunities to serve the other members of the body. What is a head without a body? No one is a shepherd if he doesn't have sheep. He served the sheep. He built the church. He had a body. Now Ephesians 5 says that the manner in which he did it wasn't that he didn't just do it because he had to. But he loved that church as his own body. He loved it to death.
And it was that motive of love that was the power. Because intellectually, we can start thinking of ourselves as the worst of sinners, and we can intellectually say, they're better and I need them. But that's not really doing it in the body. That's not what Christ really did. Because Christ didn't do these things because he had to. Christ did these things because he loved the body. Because he loved the members. Because he loved you. Love one another. Jesus as they argued who could be the greatest and they were jealous because Peter, James and John prepared the upper room and they argued with each other in anger about why they didn't have that right and privilege to have that honor so Jesus got on his knees and he washed their dirty stinking feet And then he said this. Know ye not what I have done unto you? Ye call me Master and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, Ye ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If I know these th if ye know these things, happy are ye, not if just you know them, but if you do them. Blessed, happy, if you do them. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. That's Christmas. That's why it's such a wonderful event. Changes the way the world looks at it. But then that event has the greatest meaning for us. And that's what we want to do too. Let this mind, as exemplified by Jesus Christ, be in you. Now realize, beloved, that it doesn't come out that way in the language of the King James because the idea is you already have that mind you don't have to conjure it up you as a member of the body of Jesus Christ already have it you are a part of him what the admonition is that you take upon yourself the concrete duties exemplified by Christ. That you truly do the exercises, the spiritual exercises that start with, there is the glory of God. Holy, holy, holy. And I look at my hands, and I look at the crevices, and I look at the dirt. And then I start going inside and I see the manure pile. 
that touches every motive and everything I say. And yet he says, Sinner, convinced of your sin? Oh, who cry only with the publican, Oh, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Because you don't see anybody else. And he says, Sinner, I love you. And the amazement that he would keep loving even me. Then come what may in my life, there may be deaths of loved ones. There's going to be hurts, and the devil's going to use them all to say, get at him, get even. And God says, look at my son. You want to be his disciple? Then listen to him in Matthew 16, verse 24. You want to be my disciple? Then it starts right here. Deny yourself. You've heard me. It's not about me. It's about him. It's not about me. It's all about him. To God be the glory, not me. Take up your cross. Many afflictions. It's the attitude with which you have you approach them. They are God-given opportunities to reflect Jesus. Serve each other. Follow him. Let this mind be in you. So that even this, Ephesians 4, work with your hands so that you can have to give to him that needs. Not so you can save something for the future. Not so that you can eat. No, you have in order to give. Whatever he had, he gave for you. Amen. Our Father, we thank thee for such love. And it becomes increasingly amazing. We thank Thee for such grace and mercy. That's the gospel. That's why it's such good news for us. We thank Thee for it. Give Thy blessing to us now, especially to Garrett, but to all of us, that this may serve to show us the wonder of the manger and of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen.